Father, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. iconic songs one of the most iconic liberation songs ever and that's bob marley's zimbabwe bob marley's zimbabwe written in the late 1970s but immortalized in his performance at zimbabwe's independence day april 17 well the independence day was april 18 but the performance was on april 17 1980 all right big big tune Big, big moment, and we'll talk a little more about it the further we go in the video. But why am I doing this today? One of my favorite days of the year. One of my favorite days of the year, the Zimbabwean independence, right? You know, you already know that's where uh, Dr. Mavima's from, uh, land we love. Um, so, yeah. So today I decided to do something a little special, a little different, in that we are looking at... Zimbabwe's independence came in 1980, right? So if you know about uh, the decolonial process, that is far, that is pretty late into the process. A lot of the countries had gotten their independence in the 1960s, a few more in the 1970s, like in Mozambique and the like. Then Zimbabwe got its independence in 1980. In fact, Zimbabwe and South Africa were the sort of holdouts of imperialism, uh, at least uh, overt imperialism, in Africa, right? There were the two holdouts and there were settler colonies as well. So it was heightened by issues of race and, and land ownership and things like that. Uh, what threw in Namibia there as well, though Namibia usually comes to South Africa, but those are the three countries that were left. So I say this to say, when Zimbabwe got its independence in 1980, it was a momentous thing. It left only really uh, the apartheid system in South Africa as the last bastion of imperialism. So when I talk about this, I decided to do something, you know, as today is Independence Day, is to look at who, what guests came from around the world to celebrate or to commemorate this event. Okay. Who came from around the world? And I chose, I've chosen five individuals from the Pan-African community, from the global Pan-African community. Uh, the likes of Prince Charles were also there, and that's cool, but that's not really who I'm focused on on this on this on this uh, on this channel. Uh, a lot of other African leaders were also there. All right, shout out to the likes of Muammar Gaddafi, uh, you know Nyerere, and the likes were also there. But I've decided not to focus on them as well, largely because not because of any uh, reasons that 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 speak to their importance no because they were the absolute juggernauts that helped independence become a thing but i feel on this channel i talk about them in other videos and i'll probably talk about them in other videos but there was also a lot of them who were there but i decided to pick five people who represent sort of pan-africanism at the time from outside the continent of africa okay so we'll talk about them we'll talk about uh, a little bit about them and their lives and where we can talk about their connection to zimbabwe and what their experience in Zimbabwe was, or what they said about being there. So we're looking at these five individuals uh, who were guests at Zimbabwe's Independence Day celebrations in Harare, 1980. Okay, so stay tuned, and we'll run through them, and I will see you guys at the end. Now, the first of these figures we'll be looking at is the iconic scholar activist socialist leaning uh pan-africanist uh guyanese scholar walter rodney right walter rodney who incidentally was the inspiration for this video um because as i was doing some work recently i came across the fact which you know surprise surprise i should have known this that he was in zimbabwe for independence day 
1980, and I, I decided to find out who else was there. And uh, presto, we have this project coming. So Walter Rodney, who was Walter Rodney? So Walter Rodney was born in 1942 in Georgetown, British Guyana, um, which is modern day Guyana. Caribbean culturally, but uh, situated in South America as an island. Um, and he was born to a particularly political family. He was born to a particularly political family with his father deeply involved in the People's Progressive Party, which was a, a multiracial party. And back then, it was the one uh, for, for the common people, if you will. If you, if you can imagine, this is deep within, within, um, within the colonial era of, of, of British Guyana and the other Caribbean islands. So even before he became a teenager, he was already uh, Walter Rodney was already deep, uh, steeped deeply within uh, the, the the political activist culture. Goes to school, and while he is at school, he won the coveted Guyana scholarship to the University College of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica, right? Which, in that region, in the Caribbean, it was viewed as a traditional pathway to academic prestige and and, 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 and distinction. It was the place to go to. Picture Oxford uh, in, 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 in England. Picture Makerere in East Africa, right? It was that sort of space that, that, that he was in, that, that, that he found himself in. In 1963, Rodney graduated with first-class honors in history from the University College of the West Indies, UCWI, and was awarded another scholarship to the University of London where he entered the School of Oriental and African Studies to work on his doctorate in African, uh, in African history. He was off to a great start. And while he was in London, now if you know, if you know about the workings of, of, um, of mid-20th century uh, London, there was a hub of Pan-Africanist activity, right? A lot of people from co the quote-unquote empire had ended up over there. Uh, including the likes of Kwame Nkrumah at some point, and we're now actively involved uh, in, in 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 plotting, if you will, a, as scholars. Um, the 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 the, uh, the anti-colonial and post-colonial condition of, of of black and brown people around the world. So he uh, he immediately became part of a study group of younger West Indians who met regularly under the guidance of the man who was. Then the, 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 the figurehead of, uh, uh, of revolutionary intellectuals, C.L.R. James, who himself was Trinidadian, was a Trinidadian Marxist scholar and who had written such books as The History of the Pan-African Revolt, originally The History of the Negro Revolt, and The Black Jacobins focusing on, on the Haitian Revolution. Rodney's dissertation, titled A History of the Upper Guinea Coast, 1545 to 1800, was published in 1970 by the Oxford University Press and was widely acclaimed for its originality in challenging the conventional wisdom on the topic. So he was a man about his business. But even before it was published in 1966, Rodney left London for Tanzania and during the 1966-1967 year, academic year, he taught history at the University College of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Then in 1968, he returned to Jamaica, where, you know, the back to UCWI, where he sought out to, to develop a major program in African and Caribbean studies. Walter Rodney was very critical of the middle class in its role in, in, post, in the post-independence Caribbean, right? Very critical of the middle class. Uh, he was also a strong critic of capitalism and argued that under only the ban of socialism and through the leadership of the working classes could Africa break from imperialism. <clears throat> so immediately when you hear that, you should know where this is going. Who is likely to be offended by that? 
Well, if you've read uh, Franz Fanon and know of uh, the pitfalls of nationalism, you know that the the new ruling class, right? The post. Remember, Jamaica had just got its independence in the in the mid sixties. So, when you're coming in the middle class in a capitalist system, you're coming at the people who rule. You're coming at the, especially when you have a uh, conservative government, and also. This idea of critiquing capitalism would not have sat well with the powers that be who are trying to ingratiate themselves with the Western world at the height of the Cold War. So what happens? On October 15, that year, 1968, the Jamaican government, under the Prime Minister Hugh Shearer, declared Rodney a persona non grata. He was banned from from Jamaica, and he never came back. By the way, um, the decision to ban him from ever returning to Jamaica, and his firing from the university, uh, caused protests by students and the poor people of Kingston, which uh, escalated into riots, which are today known as the Rodney riots, and resulted in six deaths and caused millions of dollars in damages. This riot started on. 16 October, so the following day after he was fired, and they actually ended up having the 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 adverse effect for the government of increasing political awareness across the Caribbean. Um, and bear in mind that this is 1968, right? So what else is happening at this time? The civil rights movement is at a, at a whole time fever pitch with the assassination of of of, of Malcolm and Martin. The Black Star this revolution is happening at the same time. SNCC. Is is, 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 is is running havoc as well uh, in the U.S. In the meantime, on the continent, uh, the Organization of African Unity has been recently founded, and now, you know, the Chimurenga is raging in Zimbabwe. Frelimo, uh, MPLA in Angola are, are doing their thing. So this was a very... This is just one of those factors that adds to this cocktail of Pan-African and Afrocentric uprising right when he was but despite all those protests Walter Rodney never made it back to Jamaica so in 1969 a couple of things happened first of all his first book Groundings with My Brothers is published the book drew largely from his ethnographic work with the Rasta community, the Rastafari community of Jamaica in the early 1960s, and as thus was very much concerned with things of culture, right? And it also continued to rally against the excesses of the middle class in the post-colonial, um, you know, black world. For example, he writes, one of the major dilemmas inherent in the attempt by black people to break through the cultural aspects of white imperialism is posed by the use of historical knowledge as a weapon of our struggle. The white man has already implanted numerous historical myths in the minds of black peoples, and those have to be uprooted, since they can act as a, dra a drag on a revolutionary activity in the present epoch. Under these circumstances, it is necessary to direct our historical activity in the light of two basic principles. Firstly, the effort must be directed solely towards the freeing and mobilizing of black minds. There must be no performances to impress whites, for those whites who find themselves beside us on the firing line will be there for reasons far more profound than their exposure to African history. Secondly, the acquired knowledge of African history must be seen as, a, as directly irrelevant, but secondary to the concrete tactics and strategies which are necessary for our liberation. End quote. And wow, there is so much to unpack there, right? There's so much to unpack there. Talking about allyship, talking about breaking away from Eurocentric measures of, of excellence, and talking about, and this question still come up today, right? Talking about what we call slacktivism, in which your understanding of history trumps what actually needs to be done, and he rallies against all that. Okay. And again, this dovetails perfectly with a contemporary, a scholarly contemporary of his, Franz Fanon, who writes a lot about about the pitfalls of nationalism, and 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 so forth. Now, 
thereafter, uh, together with the publishing of that book, oh, there's another quote here that I also want to engage that is very important to my own philosophy vis-a-vis -vis this. Because as we study African history, a lot of times we like to center it on the the glories, the, the, the extraordinary, right? Which uh, We talk about the pyramids, we talk about Axum, we talk about the Great Zimbabwe, we talk about Mansa Musa's uh, Hads, uh, and so forth as if that's the only thing that makes that gives africa agency and walter rodney in groundings with my brothers writes even within those kingdoms the historical accounts often concentrate narrowly on the behavior of elite groups and dynasties we need to portray the elements of african everyday life and to comprehend the culture of africans irrespective of whether they were resident in the empire of Mali or an Igbo village. In reconstructing African civilizations, the concern is to indicate that African social life had meaning and value, and that the African past is one which the black man in the Americas can identify with pride. With, that, with the same criteria in mind, it is worth noting the following aspects of African social behavior. Hospitality, the role and treatment of the aged, law and public order, and social tolerance, end quote. And the idea here is when you celebrate Africa, don't just sell a pick and choose what you think the rest of the world will, will, will appreciate as being glorious. We have to define greatness on our own terms, and part of that greatness exists in the villages. It exists in, 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 in how we treat each other and so forth. So I just thought that was powerful. This is supposed to be biographical, or not philosophical. So I do apologize for going off on that tangent, but I thought that was very important. In addition to publishing Groundings with my brothers, that same year, Walter Rodney returned to Dar es Salaam, to the University College of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, where he taught, uh, where he served as a professor of history until 1974. He, was, he continued to be close to C.L.R. James, and others who were socialist leaning and supported the socialist government of Julius Nyerere, who was the first president of Tanzania, uh, architect of JAMA and very, uh, very important name in African history. While his academic work, Rodney's academic work, uh, was contributing to the emergence of decolonized African social sciences, he also spent a lot of time disseminating knowledge in, in, in Tanzanian villages, right? Where he spoke uh, Kiswahili, um, and he was uh, he pushed on with his with his Pan Africanism, and went remained critical again of the African middle class, denouncing leaders like Idi Amin, uh, Francis Bonyi of of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Joseph Mobutu, of course, of, 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 of Zaire at the time, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, who had, who he accused of turning tribalism, to, uh, turning to tribalism in the, in the, under the guise of black empowerment and negritude. It was also during this time that Walter Rodney came to the fore, uh, to the attention of, of black America, by black America we mean in the U.S., where in May of 1970, he participated in the second annual gathering of the African Her Heritage Studies Association at Howard University. And uh, the, uh, the African Heritage Studies uh, Association itself, AHSA, has, a, has had a storied history, right, even though it was young at the time, having broken ranks with the African Studies Association just a year prior um, uh, in, in, a, in a famous... Um, incident in, in Canada accusing them of being racist and having this sort of uh, paternalistic approach to the study of Africa. It was mostly white scholars who were doing that. So he broke away from that uh, and then went on to speak so much that people who didn't know this this dark-skinned guy from Guyana speaking in the U.S. You know, Guyana is a relatively smaller country, right? So the fact that he came to their attention really speaks to his impact, uh, to the attention of folks in the U.S. and Jamaica and other bigger places. Then in 1972, the game would change when he would publish the book by which he became synonymous, 
And that book is... In Pan-Africanism and anti-imperialism and, and, and socialist-leaning ideology, that book is often spoken of within the same vein as Franz Fanon's uh, The Wretched of the Earth, among other such pivotal texts that came out around that time. And just to show you the, the level of, of, of influence and, and wisdom that comes out of it, I will read here a few quotes from the book. Right. For the only great men among the unfree and the oppressed are those who struggle to destroy the oppressor. So again, these are sentiments that are echoed in such books as, as Franz Fanon's um, you know, Wretched of the Earth. A culture is a total way of life. It embraces what people ate and what they wore, the way they talked and the way they walked, the manner in which they treated death and greeted the newborn. I'll read another quote here. Many guilty consciences have been created by the slave trade. Europeans know that they carried on the slave trade, and Africans are aware that the trade would have been impossible if certain Africans did not cooperate with slave ships. To ease their guilty consciences, Europeans try to throw the major responsibility for the slave trade onto the Africans. One major author of the slave trade, appropriately titled The Sins of Our Fathers, explained how many white people urged him to state that the trade was the responsibility of African chiefs and that Europeans merely turned up to buy captives, as though without European demand there would have been captives sitting on the beach by the millions. Issues such as those are not the principal concern of this study, but they can be correctly approached only after understanding that Europe became the center of the worldwide system and that it was European capitalism which set slavery and the Atlantic slave trade in motion. End quote. The idea of the book, as the name suggests, and this it does a good job of, speaks to how contemporary African condition uh, contemporary today as it was in 1972 when the book was published, has been a result of this, of this imperialism uh, as imposed by the Europeans. Now, that may sound like a lazy argument to some, but if you want to read one book that lays it out perfectly, it is Walter Rodney's How Europe and a Developed Africa. He does a great job of that. Indeed. So... During that time as well, Walter Rodney would get other books published, I mean other writings published, including in 1974, um, he put something out in the Harvard Educational Review titled uh, Education in Africa and Contemporary Tanzania, which again was based on the work that he had been doing uh, while he taught in, in Dar es Salaam. Uh, he also published a couple other texts, including... History of the Guyanese Working People, 1881 to 1905, as well as Guyanese sugar plantations in the late 19th century. 1974 would be his last year teaching in Tanzania, and the year got off to a great start as early in 1974 he had received an appointment as professor and chairman of history at the University of Guyana. So this would be his first year back home, back in the region really, since he was expelled from uh, from Jamaica. Of course, he'd been back there for conferences and other things, but this would be the first year he would be back in an academic capacity, and he was supposed to start that fall of 1974. So when he was done with his appointment in Tanzania that summer of 1974, he was invited to spend time at the Institute of the Black World, the phenomenal organization founded by Vincent Harding, Robert Hill, and Bill Strickland in Atlanta, USA. So this would be another chance to network with yet another community within the Pan-African community that 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 uh, he hadn't spent as much time with. So he goes over there, spends more than a month at the IBW, primarily in the development and leadership of a summer research symposium. And people came from around the country and the Caribbean to spend time with, you know, breaking bread with him in this project. However, as time came for him to leave for, the, for his job, even before he left, things started 
things were sounding a little bit fishy with the University of Guyana. By the time he arrived in Guyana, the official word had been given. At the last moment, in an, in an unprecedented move, the appointment was cancelled, apparently the result of pressure from the highest level of government. If you can imagine this, this is Guyana. He had been kicked out of Jamaica for being too revolutionary, and now he was being his job at the biggest university in the country of his birth uh, was also being cancelled on the premise that he was again too radical. Think about that for a moment. Okay. <laughs> Despite being barred from teaching, from his teaching job and just being a pseudo persona non grata in the country of his birth, Rodney was not going to go away just like that. So he got to work, right? Uh, the first thing that he did in the same year, 1974, was to consolidate and centralize the Working People's Alliance, which uh, became a, a, his political base and a very socialist-leaning organization. But at the time, in 1974, when he centralized it, it wasn't a political party, but it was just a movement, right? all inspired by sort of Marxist ideals. And during that whole time, he continued to work with other leaders of what we call the third world. And that is not the, the understanding of it we have today of, of the, the poorer nations, even though a lot of them coincide with that. But the third world really means uh, nations that took neither the side of the USSR or the, the US in the Cold War. So those being the two worlds, the third world is the, is the, is the cusp of countries that exist within that other realm and a lot of these were formerly colonized countries so a lot of the uh, caribbean islands latin american countries uh, asian countries all constitute the third world in any case uh how did he uh stay making an income making a living well he did a lot of uh lectures across the board in and out of guyana some of the people that he famously partnered with were James Turner, director of Africana Studies at Cornell, and Emmanuel Wallerstein of the State University of New York in Binghamton, who were some of the uh, several people who invited him to speak and sort of allow him to, to make some sort of income. Despite his excellence and being continuously invited to speak in different places, um... Rodney refused to to move, uh, stating clearly that it is imperative that I stay here. And in many ways, that would be his life mission, but ultimately be his undoing. In 1979, Walter Rodney and his comrades at the Working People's Alliance decided to turn the movement into a political party with the primary objective of holding a fire to the, to the backside of the People's National Congress, which was in power, uh, with all its capitalist excesses and, and so forth. Um, that was in June of 1979. And they got to work right away. In the following month, a government building in Georgetown was set afire, and Walter and four other WPA members were among the eight people arrested and charged with arson. You know, and think about it, it's arson of a government building, so in any place, this would be very serious. Uh, but it became very apparent almost immediately that this was a setup as part of the government's way of breaking up this movement. And there's precedents for this in history, right? Where buildings are burnt and that is used as a, a you know, I mean, Hitler comes to mind in the 1930s um, as, a, as a way to get rid of your, of your opponents. On the day of the arraignment, a Catholic priest who was standing by the by a rally, by a pro-WPA rally, was stabbed to death. And again, it's just odd right, that he'd be stabbed right there. Thereafter, the repression became more and more apparent uh, with people being arrested, um, randomly arrested, Walter Rodney and his peers, uh, bombings, police beatings, and escalating threats of extermination by the government against Rodney and other people of the, of the WPA. By February 1980, two of Walter's close comrades in the Working People's Alliance, Ohene Kowama and Edward Lublin, had been killed by the police. 
Others have been shot and beaten, jailed, houses raided, ransacked, bombed. And now, by now, a lot of the other leaders were also being held as political prisoners in Guyana, not being allowed to leave. However, Rod himself was able to get out in April of 1980 to attend the Zimbabwean Independence Day celebrations where he had been invited. Zimbabwe had, of course, been close to his heart for several reasons. Uh, if you read um, how Europe and developed Africa, there are whole sections dedicated to Zimbabwe in which he talks about the great Zimbabwe uh, of ancient times, of you know, of the of the of the of the last millennium, uh, Mutapa Empire, even the colonization of Zimbabwe. All these things form a large part of his of his uh, scholarship and his and his arguments. Furthermore, Zimbabwe was one of the last few bastions of white supremacy in, in, in Africa after much of the continent had been decolonized. It was really just Zimbabwe and South Africa left at the, t at the tail end of that, of, 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 of the colonial era. So the going down of Rhodesia and its transformation into Zimbabwe was seismic. Um, as far as the global black resistance movement goes. And also at the time, Zimbabwe was one of the countries that was flirting with, uh, with socialism as a way of administering a post-colonial project. So this would be something that Rodney, with his own ideology, would have been very interested in, in partnering up with. So he went to Zimbabwe and was part of the festivities. Um, then... He got back, when he got back to Guyana after that is when everything went south for him. On the 2nd of June, 1980, the arson trial began. And uh, the, the, the trial was observed by several people from around the Caribbean, the United States, and even Great Britain, right? Because it was such a big deal and people wanted to make sure that justice would be administered. And Im immediately afterwards, within a week or so, it was obvious that the government did not have a case and could not pro pro prosecute uh, Rodney and his, and his colleagues. So four days later, on June 6th, the trial was adjourned to August 20th. One week from then on, Friday evening, June 13, Walter Rodney was sitting in his brother's car, waiting for his brother at the driver's seat. They have stopped at the house of a man who, you know, it is now understood had infiltrated the ranks of the WPA. Uh, his brother went in to pick up what the man said was a walkie-talkie that Walter wanted. As they stood in front of the man's house around 7.30 p.m., he told Walter Rodney to drive off and wait for a test signal at 8, p 8, 8 p.m. Uh, his brother, Donald, returned to the car and drove away. When the signal came... It turned out to be an, the explosion that ended Walter Rodney's life. Who was responsible for his death quickly evolved into two arguments. The government of Guyana claimed that Rodney caused his own death by accidentally switching on an illegally obtained bomb concealed in a walkie-talkie. It's so ridiculous. While the WPA claimed a bomb had been hidden in the walkie-talkie given to Rodney and his brother by an undercover government agent. The WPA alleged the bomb was then remotely detonated by that agent who immediately left the country on a flight arranged by the government. So this all sounds like conspiracy right now, right? But wait a minute. In reports released in Washington, D.C. in June th on June 13, 2020, that's 40 years after the, to the day uh, after Walter Rodney's assassination, the U.S. Embassy in Guyana in 19, you know, reports stated that the U.S. Embassy in Guyana in 1980 had strong evidence to believe that the death of Rodney in Georgetown was a political assassination, according to declassified documents obtained and posted uh, today, again, June 13, 2020, for the first time by the National Security Archive at the George Washington University. In 2014, the president of Guyana established a commission to investigate the death. It was terminated early after a new government came to power, 
but the commission's report nevertheless concluded that state authorities had been behind the operation. A source of great frustration to Rodney's family and others is the fact that the full report has still not been released. When asked before his death about the, 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 the worries he had, because at this point he had started to tell people in Africa and the U.S. that this may be the last time that they see him. So he, might, he seemed to have ominously known that the end was nigh. But when asked about his safety, this is what Walter Rodney had said. As to my own safety and the safety of a number of other persons within the WPA, we will try to guarantee our safety by the level of political mobilization and political action inside and outside the country. Ultimately, it is this rather than any kind of physical defense which will guarantee our safety. None of us are unmindful of the threat that is constantly posed. We don't regard ourselves as adventurers, as martyrs, or potential martyrs, but we think there is a job which needs to be done, and of a certain point in time, we have to do what, it, what has to be done. End quote. So those are the words of a phenomenal scholar, uh, brave activist, who was assassinated by his own government two months uh, after he had been to celebrate the Zimbabwean Independence Day celebrations. Now next up I will talk about two people, right? I'll talk about two f huge figures and I'll speak about them in sort of unison. Uh, so consider this the second and the third entry put together. And the reason I'm doing that is because they were part of the same delegation. Uh, they come from the same place. Uh, and they pretty much represent a very similar position. And I'm talking about Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young, as well as Ambassador Don McHenry, both of the United States of America, right? Two uh, prominent African-American leaders who were instrumental, instrumental in an intimate way to the advent of, of independence and happened to be there as well at the celebrations. And I'll start off by talking to Andrew Young, uh, talking about Andrew Young here, who's uh, the older of the two, and who was succeeded by Don McHenry in his position as an um, as the chief delegate to the United Nations and the, the Carter administration. So I'll be talking about all that. Let's get to it. So Andrew Young, or full name Andrew Jack Jackson Young Jr., was born in March 1932 in New Orleans the southern U.S. He grew up in a middle-class black family uh, and attended segregated southern schools as was the, the norm at the time. However, he later entered Howard University, which is sort of the mecca of, uh, of SBCUs, right, as a pre-med student. But I found the going a little bit tough and he turned to ministry and graduated in 1955 from Hartford Theological Seminary in Connecticut with a divinity degree. Then he passed at several black churches, during which time he met and became acquainted with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, joined him in leading the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, right, the SCLC. Um, and, you know, he even continued working with that organization after Martin Luther King had died, up until 1970. In the 1970s, he ran for Congress. Uh, in 1972, after after one or two attempts, and he won that one. Then he was re-elected re again in 1974 and in 1976. And one of the things that he was renowned for during that time in the House was uh, opposing the cutting of funds to social programs while also um, trying to block additional funding to the war in Vietnam, right, which, was, which, which had already been ill-fated by that time. Back Jimmy Carter all the way, so he, clearly he was a Democrat. He is a Democrat. And uh, after Carter's victory in, in the 1976 presidential election, Young was made the United States ambassador to the United Nations in 1977. In fact, as part of his hearings, as, as his confirmation hearings, Andrew Young had made... Uh, transitioning to full independence in Zimbabwe, a large part of his campaign. 
right along along with uh, work in namibia and south africa as well but zimbabwe was very prominent he spoke about wanting to see uh sovereignty and and self a majority rule in, in zimbabwe and in fact his apparent sympathy with the with the third world he did a lot of work in these different places you know uh, would ultimately get him in trouble it was very controversial and he was actually for, forced to resign in 1979 from his role after it became known that he had met with a representative of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which was against uh, an agreement made by the U.S. government that they would not meet with the PLO before they met with Israeli leaders and so forth. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, so Zimbabwe, right? So in 1977, in his confirmation hearings, he makes Zimbabwe a big deal. And actually, in 1977, he would meet, that same year, he would meet Robert Mugabe at a party uh, in, in Tanzania, right? And, you know, organized by Julius Nyerere and, 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 his, uh, and his folks. And this is how the encounter went. And I'm quoting from a 2013 interview in the Herald, which is Zimbabwe's uh, foremost newspaper here. He says... I first met Robert Mugabe at the at the party, uh, the party that I just described. Long before this, a visiting Catholic priest whom I met in the U.S. wanted me to meet one of his brilliant students by the name of Robert Mugabe. From then onwards, I became eager to meet him. So at the party, I saw this beautiful woman standing alone in a corner, all alone, and that's who I went up and to talk to. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I'm Andrew Young, and she said, I'm Sally Mugabe. And I said, you are related to that awful terrorist, Robert Mugabe, aren't you? And this may have been tongue-in-cheek uh, at the time, because he was obviously fond of, 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 of Mugabe already, but in any case. And she said, he is my husband. And just then, Mugabe had seen me, and he leaned over and said, young man, in Africa, before we speak to the wives, we meet the husbands first. And we laughed, and we became good friends. We met and we liked each other. That was my first encounter with Robert Mugabe. Now at this time, end quote, now at this time it's important to understand that Southern Africa was not necessarily on the foremost agenda of the Western world, especially at the height of the Cold War. If anything, it was being used as a proxy in the Cold War, right, to make sure that the Soviet Union doesn't get a foothold in the region. So... Uh, I go back to quoting here. Most people in Congress were in the dark. The CIA was involved in assassinations in Chile and all over the world. I started talking to Carter about human rights and democracy. I said, my friend MLK gave his life for certain principles in life. I told myself that I, I choose to be with Martin Luther. So from then on, he had the full blessing of the Carter administration and became the figurehead in many ways, uh, along with a couple other people, including uh, Don Mark Henry, who we'll talk about shortly in these negotiations. One of his signature achievements was helping the Carter administration to develop policy guidelines that called for maintaining the, uh, for the maintaining of economic sanctions against Rhodesia, despite the election of Bishop Abel Mzorewa a puppet prime minister of the short-lived Zimbabwe Rhodesia. So let's talk a little bit about that here, about what happened. So, in 1979, Young played a leading role in, the adva in advancing a settlement in Rhodesia with Robert Mugabe and Joshua Nkomo. Right. This settlement paved the way for Mugabe to take power as prime minister of the newly formed Zimbabwe. There had been a general election in 1979 which had brought Bishop Abel Mzorewa to power as its leader, as the leader of the United African National Council, leading to the short-lived country of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, which was clowned at the time because it was clearly a puppet government, and the joke was, you know, Zimbabwe becomes the only country with the last name. Young refused to accept the election results and described the election as, as neo-fascist, a sentiment echoed by the United Nations Security Council Resolution 445, and the situation was resolved the next year with the Lancaster House Agreement and the establishment of Zimbabwe. Now, again, to say this is to say this did not is not to say that this came without its controversies, 
because Yang's favoring of Mugabe and Como over Mzorewa and his predecessors and ally Ian Smith had been controversial. It was supported by many African American activists such as Jesse Jackson and Coretta Scott King, uh, but others, including Bayard Rustin, which which I thought was interesting, argued that the 1979 election had been free and fair. Among other leaders who seemed to be to be for Muzorewa, who probably uh, they were drawn in by his uh, moderacy, but really the masses were with the with the patriotic front as led by um, Komo and Mugabe. The idea here is not to posit some America-centric argument uh, that exaggerates his role in all this. By his own admission, he pretty much maintained a ringside seat during the protracted negotiations that le uh, that led to the independence of Zimbabwe. But it's just there to show that he had in he had been in Carter's ear about maintaining these sections and which side of history he falls on. That's what we're emphasizing here. And he said himself, securing negotiations leading to the Lancaster House talks was a major milestone. What we had decided in Zimbabwe spread to Southwest Africa and this work in South Africa. Bloodless transformation of power. You know, and a few, uh, you know, in 1978, he had been asked, because remember, this is the time when Mugabe and Komo are being spoken of as terrorists, right? And he was asked by the New York Times, oh, sorry, by the Times of London on May 22, 1978, does Mr. Mugabe strike you as a violent man? To which he responded, not at all. He's a very gentleman. In fact, one of the ironies of the whole struggle is that I can't imagine Joshua Nkomo or Robert Mugabe ever pulling the trigger on a gun to kill anyone. I doubt they ever have. I find that I'm fascinated by his intelligence, by his dedication. The only thing that frustrates me about Robert Mugabe is that he is so damned incorruptible. The problem is he was educated by Jesuits. And when you get the combination of a Jesuit and a Marxist kind of philosophy merging in one person, you've got a hell of a guy to deal with. Yang was further quoted in the interview. And it's interesting to hear him say these things because uh, knowing what we know about Mugabe uh, at the tail end of his life, um, it's... Uh, you know, incorruptible and, and violent uh, and not violent uh, are not words that necessarily come to to our understanding of Mugabe. Um, and interestingly, though, to his credit, Yang, who is still alive, would say these things right up until Mugabe's uh, passing away in, 20, you know, in, 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 in 2019. So he was very consistent as a fan of, of Robert Mugabe, even through all his turmoil. The U.S., after, after the agreement had been done in 1980, the United States rushed to establish relations with the new government, becoming the first country to officially open its embassy. Young presided over a ceremony in which the United States agreed to provide $2 million for the rehabilitation of 160 provincial health centers as the first installment of a $15 million of aid promised that fiscal year, which would become pivotal as we talk about Mark Henry a little bit later. In 1981, Young was elected mayor of Atlanta, and he was re-elected re to that post in 1985, serving until 1990. In 1983, Mugabe visited the United States, and he was invited specifically to Atlanta by Andrew Young, the trip, um, Mr. Young described Mr. Mugabe as a good friend and one of the most thoughtful world leaders I've ever met. He praised Zimbabwe as a triumph of democracy in Africa. Mayor Young said he hoped the visit would underscore Atlanta's role as an international gateway and would help persuade Zimbabwe to open a tourist office there. Interestingly, and I, I'm only making this connection right now. I haven't even thought about this as I was putting this together. When you get to the airport in Atlanta, which I've traveled to for a couple of conferences, there is a huge Zimbabwean presence, like sculptures and, and other artworks and, and music. 
that that is uh, very definitively Zimbabwean. And according to their website, they, they say the same thing, right? The Shona sculptures. And I'm just wondering now if there's any connection to those uh, attempts to make the connection by Mary Young back in the day to this, or if that's a separate thing. But in any case, it is very interesting to see the connection between the two places to this day. In 1990, Young ran for governor of Georgia but lost in the Democratic primary. Uh, he later established the Andrew J. Young Foundation in 2003, which focused on education, economic justice, and human rights. He's also written several books, including uh, A Way Out of Norway in 1994, as well as An Easy Burden, The Civil Rights Movement, and The Transformation of America which came out in 1996. So there's a lot to be said here about Andrew Young. Uh, you know, he's still kicking. He's 89 years old now, uh, but definitely a seismic figure. So let's get to talking about Donald McHenry. Donald McHenry. Now, after... Andrew Young had been forced to resign by the Carter administration for his meetings with the, with the PLO, which again is testament to his influence, right? That he was, he was uh, forced to resign from his position, but still continued to be such a prominent figure in the administration, right through uh, to attending the, the, the Zimbabwean Independence Day and only to go on to become mayor uh, for as long as he was. Uh, but in any case, when he so he uh, Young served that term from seventy seven to seventy nine, seventy nine to eighty one. That position belonged to Donald McHenry. Uh, McHenry was born in St. Louis, Missouri, another southern city, and uh, grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois. He attended Illinois State University, graduated with a BS in nineteen fifty seven. Then he went on to get his master's degree from Southern Illinois University in 1950, uh, and 1959, then went on to get, his, uh, to get a PhD from Georgetown University. So McHenry and Andrew Young are a very unlikely pair, and the story of how they met is pretty fascinating, because McHenry is a little bit younger, but he's a scholar through and through, right? He's a scholar through and through. Whereas uh, Young is coming more from a civil rights activist background. So their influences would be dueling, but they got along famously and they did amazing work together. In fact, after he got a doctorate, after McHenry got a doctorate, he spent uh, two years at the Brookings Institute in, in New York, which is famed for its foreign policy trainings, spent two years between 71 and 73, at which he did research on South Africa, right? Which would, again, foreshadow his, his particular interest in this. Um, he would speak at length, by now, he's in the system, he would speak at length, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, criticizing the apartheid regime, the Ian Smith regime in Zimbabwe, and so forth. And in fact, he gave a great interview in 1978, um, which I will put the link in the description, um, at the you know in a McNeil Lira report, where he spoke alongside where he was interviewed alongside Joshua Nkomo, who is a, who, a part of the Patriotic Front, and Muzorewa, who is the the leader of the of uh, Rhodesia Zimbabwe, and they are pretty much just being asked on whether the whole situation is legitimate you know this is before the election of course but whether people would the masses would be willing to ride with Muzorewa as opposed to the patriotic front and it's just very fascinating to see him right in the thick of things in that way um but he would go on again to play a very important role in this however it's important to know that as he worked with andrew young andrew young took the lead on zimbabwe they both worked on southern africa but Andrew Young took the lead on Zimbabwe while um, Mark Henry was more the main person in 
in Namibia. But in any case, they were both at the Independence Day celebrations. And actually, the f a couple years later, Mark Henry was back in Zimbabwe. And as he was walking down the street, um, he was recognized by a shopkeeper who pointedly asked, where's all that money from America? Right, Because the U.S. had promised to support, uh, even though with the British taking the lead, but the U.S. had promised to, to support uh you know pump millions of dollars into the zimbabwean economy um and the and the and the quote here the the quote at the time was the russians provide the arms in africa the americans provide the aid uh which would make the u.s a more valued friend especially after independence uh was was you know the u.s was sort of reneging on his promises right um and you know, so so these are these are some of the things that he, that 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 Mark Henry was confronted with as a recognizable figure in an independent Zimbabwe. Ambassador Mark Henry, fresh from meeting with Prime Minister Robert Mugabe at the time, acknowledged that there is a gap between expectations and performances of the American government in the reconstruction assistance uh, after the bitter seven-year war, a uh, seven-year war in Zimbabwe. Many Zimbabweans, uh, you know, of course, they saw the aid question as a much broader terms than dollars and cents. They wanted to make sure that America has their back in all this. And uh, they were starting to get worried that they may not have had their back. Um, and again, in all this, it is important to know that the role that Andrew Young and Donald Mark Henry was also recognized by Mugabe himself, who would go, who go, who who traced the history of the negotiations and referred to the efforts of Andrew Young and Donald McHenry to achieve a diplomatic solution to the to the Zimbabwean uh, to the end of the Rhodesian uh, uh, to the downfall of the Rhodesian government. He also expressed appreciation for American financial and material support, especially in the area of refugees. This had given his people hope. Now, this was Mugabe talking directly to Carter in August 1980, so just a few months after Independence Day, but he's celebrating the effort of these two prominent African-American men who had, without necessarily putting the name Pan-Africanism on things, had stood as Pan-African icons in the dismantling of, the, of, of, of Rhodesia and would go on to do the same for Namibia and South Africa as well. So they definitely deserve our recognition today. Wow. So what a ride. Am I right? Thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, when I started to make this video, I wanted it to be just one video. But after I recorded the, the audio, I saw that it was a little bit long. So I decided to split it into two. So now this is the first of two parts uh, of a two parts video that's coming out. The next part, part two will be out in the next 48 hours. So two days. Um, and I sort of saved the best for last. And it's much shorter than this one. So make sure you, you check that out as well when it drops. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around so much. And uh, again, happy Independence Day, Zimbabwe. And y'all have a great weekend. <laughs>